So thanks everyone for coming. Deborah de Fijic Roguera is our last artist in residence for the season. She's been here for almost three weeks. And she's the Alaska Native Artist in Residence. She comes to us from Petersburg. Um, she has done a number of things while she's been here, including teaching a wonderful Raven's Tail weaving class, worked with 4-H youth, and um, we're able to set up more chairs if anyone needs more chairs. Thanks for coming. And additionally, she's also given a number of talks, and at this talk in particular, she's going to be speaking about a selection of artifacts from the permanent collection. She spent some time studying our Tilcap textiles here, as well as a number of other things. And as I said, she is from Petersburg. Her mother was born and raised in Mountain Village, Alaska, and now lives in Juneau. Her grandmother, Frances Tamaray Shepherd, was born in Wrangell, and she passed away at a young age. Her great grandmother was Tilly Paul Tamaray, civil rights activist, and mother to William and Louis Paul, who many of you have heard of. And Tilly's second husband, and the district's great grandfather, William Tamaray, was a community leader in Carter. The district's Tilcat and Raven's Tail teachers have been the late Clarissa Rizal, whose teacher was Jenny Clunel, Lily Hope, who is Clarissa's daughter, and Kay Parker. It is through this weaving and the art of her ancestors that she has found sobriety and an ever-growing circle of strong women and other two-spirit weavers. They share stories, lessons, mistakes, and victories. They connect with each other and reconnect with our ancestors. Deborah and these weavers are rediscovering and reviving the knowledge and stories of our plants that are embedded in the fibers of our weavings. And thank you all for being here. This is a really special weekend. It's the eve of Indigenous Peoples Day happening on Monday. Oh. So I'm so happy you can be here. And this is the thank perfect you. way for Deborah to end her talk. So with that, I'll let her introduce herself. But last but not least, thanks to the Friends of Sheldon Jacks Museum for making the Alaska Native Artist Residency Program possible and sponsoring this wonderful series of events and programs. Deborah, thank you. Great, so I just have one question. Um, only the folks on Zoom can see the slides. Are they gonna show up here? Oh, let me grab a cable and we can connect it. Okay. So for those of you who are on, okay. There's one more chair in front, so somebody can't be shy. <laughs> Or you can move the chair. <laughs> so I want you all to see. I, I pulled out some really great pictures, so I do want you guys to see the to see the pictures. Or I could I could. For those of you on Zoom, whoops, whoa, um, can you hear me? Okay, I, give me a thumbs up. Couldn't hear you. Great. Thanks, Robert. And I'm at the age where I'm wearing two glasses, one my far away and one my close up. So I have to put my far away ones to see you all and my close up to actually read. That's what we're missing is a little clicker. All right. Um, if anybody needs to take off their coats, there's a there's a coat rack right behind you. Let me go back a little bit. There we go. All right. Everybody can see okay. Great. Um, we can if you want, so they can see better. I don't need the lights to to read. Now that I have my close up glasses on. <laughs> I know getting old is, has, is challenging. All right. So let me go back. Um, thanks, Jackie, for the introduction. Um, and you actually had said most of everything that I was going to say. So that's really good. Um, I think um, the one thing that I want to say is that um, my Clinket name is Jujuk Suk. I'm Clinket Yupik and Irish. 
which has always been a very interesting um, um, combination. And I've had a lot of fun, though I have to admit that I don't know a lot about my Yupik side of me. And I'm not sure I know all that much about my Irish side either, but um, I've concentrated on trying to learn as much about my Clinket side as I can. My clan is the Tiaton. Um, I'm from the um, Cedar Bark House, which is in Wrangell. And we're a very small clan. And many of us are just in the process of learning our history, our stories, and some of us are learning our languages as, as well. And um, this is my third week, and this is my last day in, in Sitka. And I've had the pleasure of being on leave from work, which has been really nice because I've been able to come down here five days a week and weave on my um, child-sized chill cat robe, which um, looks like I've gone a lot, a lot. Um, and it seems like a lot to me. And I will be finishing this in February and will be, I'm weaving it at the same time about 20 other uh, learners like me are weaving the same size robe with basically the same design and we'll um, be finishing it the first or the last week in January and doing a um, presentation at the city museum in um, Juneau on February, first, second, or third. I'm not sure exactly the date. So if you happen to be in, in um, Juneau around that time, um, you can see them. And I think they might stay on display there. I'm not quite sure. Um, I know we're talking about how to get them back to the back to us after we've left town. But um, as I said, I am still a learner. I am by far not an expert in either Raven's Tail or Chill Cat. After my talk, you're welcome to come up and see some of the smaller pieces that I have done. Most of them are Raven's Tail. And if you're interested in the difference between Raven's Tail and Chill Cat, on the website for Friends of the uh, Sheldon Jackson Museum will be a recording of the talk that I gave 10 days ago or last week. Um, so um, there's that. Um, I only began weaving about 13 years ago, which actually seems like a long time, but it's um, not really a long time uh, for learning such a complex um, art form. I've had the honor of learning from several weavers, um, teachers. My first teacher was Clarissa Rizal, um, who is also um, has been known as Hudson. She has since passed away. Kay Parker is Raven's Tail Weaver in um, um, Juno, and if anybody's interested in learning Raven's Tale, I really encourage you to take a class from her at UAS. And she's become a master on Zoom, so you don't have to go to Juno to learn from her. And then my current teacher is Lily Hope, who is Clarissa's daughter, as well as a whole group of weavers. We weave every Sunday afternoon, mm -hmm. and um, one of the by uh, one of the benefits, if there can be that, of COVID. Um, is that for three years now, we have been weaving on Zoom every Sunday with um, weavers from all over the country and Canada. And um, I don't think we would have set that up, if, but for COVID, um, because we were all certainly isolated. Um, I've also learned basket weaving from Dolores Churchill and Janie Criswell, who um, Dolores um, is in. Actually, I don't know where exactly where she's living now. I think it might be Ketchikan. And um, 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 Janie is in uh, Juneau. Okay, that's a little bit about who I am. Um, I am hoping to keep this presentation fairly short, but um, I was asked to give a talk about what I found while I was here in either the... Um, gallery, which I know some of you just came from there, um, and from um, back of the house, which is what the staff here calls it, which is where all I think the goodies are. <laughs> and um, even as early as as um, late as this morning, I was looking and being able to really study closely um, an old chill cat robe that was just acquired. So um, I have some things just to share, and I'm going to try to go through these fairly quickly so that then there's time for um, questions and comments after, okay? All right. So this 
um, small child size robe. And I'm gonna start from one of my teacher's teachers. And this is in the gallery. This is a frog emerging from winter hibernation. This robe was made by Jenny Clanock of Click One, and it's reported to have been woven by her at around um, 1935, which is when she would have been 43 years old. This is a small Chilkat robe made of mountain goat wool, cedar bark, and lots of hours of prep and weaving time. Now, um, most Chilkat robes back, um, back before I started were all done with goats, goat, um, mountain goat wool and um, yellow cedar bark. Today, we still use um, cedar bark, yellow cedar bark, threads of it, um, hand spun into the warp, but often we don't have the access to mountain goats, so we use merino wool. I picked this to start today because Jenny was my teacher's teacher. I think it's important to always know where we come from so that we can better know where we are going. After my talk last week about Raven's Tail and Chilkat, in which I focused on the evolution of weaving and how Chilkat emerged from Raven's Tail and Formline, giving Cheryl Samuel much credit for reviving the art of Raven's Tail. Lisa, and I'm gonna, and I don't know if Lisa's on the phone, somebody's on the iPhone right now, so I'm not sure if that's Lisa or not, but Lisa, and I'm not gonna know how to pronounce her name, but by Conan, by, by Conan. She gave me a list of weavers who have visited and or contributed to the Sheldon Jackson Museum. And I just wanna give them um, credit because I'm not in this alone. There is a, there's a whole, not as many as there should be, but we're growing. Dolores Churchill, Evelyn uh, Vanderhoop, Holly Churchill, and Evelyn and Holly happen to be Dolores Churchill's um, daughters. Marie Laws, Terry Rothkar, and I don't see Marie Law, I mean, Shelly Law is on this list, but, but um, Terry Rothkar, who is, um, was a Raven's Tail weaver here in Sitka, um, is daughter to Marie Laws and sister to Shelly Laws, who has come in and helped do some research here. Um, Lily Hope, Clarissa Rizal, Jenny Criswell, Irene Jimmy, Lane Reinhardt, and then she added myself to this list as well since I had just gotten here. Um, Lisa's notes, <clears throat> um, also on the list that Peter Corey was also good friends with Selena Paradovich, who was a weaver back um, during the time when Jenny Clanat, and I um, highlight Jenny Clanat um, just part, partly because Chilkat weaving really originated in the Klaquan area, which is where Jenny was from. And that's where all the master weavers were. And so much of our weaving lineage comes from that area. And this robe is in the gallery, so you can go take a closer look at it. The, um, this is the diving whale design. Per an old catalog, um, um, description, Gladys Whitmore reported that an old man in Kills New became a Christian who owned this robe and vowed to give up his traditional Indian ways. He asked his family that when he died, he did not want to be cremated, which was the um, Clinkett traditional way of, of um, taking care of um, the dead. And he did not want his chill cat robe to be hung on his grave house. The family, however, when he died, did not follow his wishes, and they did exactly what he did not, what he had asked them not to do. And later, they also became Christian, and they, they then had started having um, second thoughts and bad feelings about what they had done, partly because the process of, of at that time, part the process of Christianity was, and I might add an editorial comment in there, part of becoming um, citizens was um, agreeing to give up your native ways and um, including lots of things, um, including burial um, traditions and rituals. So feeling bad about what they did, this um, old man's uh, family then donated the robe um, to the museum. So that's the story about how we got, how this museum got this robe. 
And I just thought it was interesting. And this robe is also in the gallery. And it's a very popular design. And I'll talk about um, why, if you start looking at robes, why this robe looks so familiar to other robes that you see in books. And I've already taken my books back because I've already started packing, but um, you can see, see that there's a lot of components in this um, that look familiar. This is a pattern board for a chill cat robe. And there are actually two patterns, one on each side, which is highly unusual. And this is also in the gallery. Um, and in a minute, I'll show you the other side. It's been reported that the men versed in the art of form line, which predated chill cats and Raven's tail, and for that matter, basketry came about and was um, evolving at the same time the art of basket making was, was, being, um, was evolving. The men versed in the art of form line would design the robe and paint the pattern boards for the weavers who were often women. Um, and the women would use these pattern boards to then make the, um, weave the robe. And you'll see on the corner of my loom here that there's a clear transparency, which is what we use today as our pattern boards. So um, we still have the pattern boards, they just are not on wood anymore. So um, there are notes that uh, about this robe in the files that the robe, Oh, let's see, there are notes that a robe following one of these patterns may be recently um, donated to the Alaska Native Heritage Center, which is up in Anchorage, when the Alaska Native um, Health Consortium, which is in Anchorage, just di recently divested all of their artwork and they had the most beautiful and extensive collection of art from all over the state, Native art all over the state that you could I'd go up to Anchorage and just walk, whether I had a medical appointment or not, I'd just go walk, I'd start at the top and walk down because the stairways um, were just filled with artwork. But anyway, ANTHC has divested all of their art and they donated it to the Alaska Native Heritage Center, which is now, I think, in the process of building a building to be able to house it because it's such an extensive collection. And so it's reported that, um, one of these, and I don't know which one to tell you the truth, one of these um, patterns um, has, a, has been woven into a robe that is in the collection that was just donated to ANHC, the Heritage Center. It also is thought that there is a robe that looks very similar to, to this pattern um, that has been um, that is in the collection for the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. So as you start delving into where our chill cat robes are, they are all over the world. In Russia, in Europe, in, um, throughout the US and in Canada, they're all over from collectors. This is the other side of the pattern board. Typically a pattern board would only depict one half of the robe um, as opposed to what we do today. Um, and that is, I think, to save time, but almost always, it's very rare, but almost always the right side mirrors the left side and vice versa. So in, in actuality, you only had to have half of it and then the weaver would um, just do the mirror image. Now what is most interesting and curious about this pattern board is not so much that it's double-sided or that one of the robes that was woven off of this pattern board was, uh, is found in Boston. What's really interesting to me personally is that this was donated to the Sheldon Jackson Museum by Mrs. T.K. Paul, who is my great-grandmother. Tilly Paul Tamry um, was her full name after her second marriage. And because it's noted in the paperwork that it's T.K. Paul, that means that was before her second marriage. So it was prior to 1903 when she was still living here in Sitka before she moved to Wrangell because she got married um, to her second husband, who's my grandpa, um, after, two, I think it was 2000, uh, 1905. Um, 
And the real curious thing about this is that I had no knowledge of this pattern board being in her possession or that she had donated it. And to the best of my knowledge, Tilly was not a weaver. And I have never heard of any mention of a pattern board. So it's curious. And of course, I sent feelers immediately out to all the family and to our family historians saying, what is this? And, and essentially the question is, um, um, and we're searching for information about whose pattern board was it? How did she come to um, possess it? And we know that she possessed it securely enough to actually donate it because she wouldn't have donated something that she did not fully possess. Um, certainly while I was putting my notes together to share this information with you, um, Tilly did um, during her first marriage before coming to Sitka, did spend some time as a official missionary for a Presbyterian church in Klukwan. And as I already said, Klukwan was the center of Chilkat weavers and perhaps that's where she um, acquired it while, her, while she was there. The last thing about pattern boards that I wanted to share is that they were typically used for several robes and could have and could and is reported to have been easily passed around amongst weavers who then often made adaptations. So you might see some, um, some variations. Um, a weaver may change um, a corner or a shape or something like that. Uh huh. Oh, no, nope. that's the first yeah. side. And lots of circles. I love the circles on that one. I don't know if you can see that, but, and lots of circles on that one too. Yeah. And this pattern board is also in the, um, in the gallery. So I'm sticking with stuff in the gallery. I just found this one interesting. I'm moving away for a moment from Chilkat weaving. Um, this comb, was carved from one piece of bone. It has 11 teeth and are curved up and out. The handle or top of the comb, which I found fascinating, has um, four drilled holes that are lined with copper. And I don't know if you can see, but the holes are actually stuffed with, um, almost looks like a, a flat pounded out copper that's been then uh, forced in there. Um, it is believed that this item may have been a shaman's comb. And at first I thought this item could not really have belonged to a shaman because shamans were known to actually not comb their hair or wash their hair. Um, <coughs> but a friend of mine who was actually with me as we were going through the, some of the exhibits um, in the gallery, and again, this one's in the gallery, pointed out that this comb actually could have belonged to a shaman and was not used as a comb that we would use or a brush to comb your hair, but as a decorative piece that would be then stuck in your hair and used as a uh, decoration. There's no other notes about this item. I just found it really fascinating. Okay, um, I've already said that um, I started off my weaving career about um, 13, 14 years ago, weaving baskets. I have always wondered how, because I've visited lots of museums and looked at baskets and they are like perfect, <coughs> cil perfect cylinders. And I said, how did they do this? Well, this is how they did it. Or some of the basket weavers did it. They made uh, molds that were round that were then fitted into the bottom of the basket and woven around that. And I, I've heard that um, to this day that there's some baskets that are in museums that still have the cardboard or some kind of stiff material that's in the bottom and that's then used to hold it um, and help make the shape um, consistent. You'll also see at the bottom, which, how do I get rid of that? So that you're not seeing that, I'm not sure. Anyway, um, and you're not seeing my pointer, but the piece of paper down at the very bottom is actually um, used for splitting the cedar bark um, in even um, 
and even strips. Today we use those jerry strippers with, um, that are used for cutting leather because it's so much easier. And then the piece of paper up top is just a piece of um, uh, brown wrapping paper, um, used like a, um, almost like a paper, brown paper bag, but it was not a brown paper bag. It was before paper bags. And it's just a design. This one I also found really, really fascinating. This item is, um, I call it, whoops, the temporary, um, hmm. holy smokes. Now I don't know, let me see if I can, I can do, whoops, go back. There, there, now you can see the whole thing. Um, what, it, what this is, is, for lack of a better word, a temporary tattoo. This is a face stamp. It's used to mark the face of important people for special occasions. This particular one came from Wrangell and it is also in the gallery. So you can see this one. And I thought this was just fascinating. So, um, and they, they would put, um, you know, dyes uh, mostly uh, from plants, roots, that would be mashed down and then mixed with grease of some kind, grease or oil of some kind, and then um, spread on that and then put on the face or on the forehead and for special occasions. Okay, now we're getting into the good stuff, the last couple of slides. So yesterday I spent about, all oh, Jackie and I spent about an hour and a half with this robe. This robe, this Chilcat robe, which is very, very old um, and very fragile, was acquired um, by Sheldon Jackson Museum from the Montgomery County Historical Society in upstate New York. This is reported to have been collected by a Colonel A.C. Berry in 1886 and was sometime later acquired by uh, Sheldon Jackson. From, him, from, we assume, Barry, but again, that transfer from Barry to Sheldon Jackson is not known. But we do know that some kind of, somehow it got into Jackson's uh, possession because um, it was in the possession of his daughters who, after he died and they no longer wanted or had any use for the blanket, then donated it to the Montgomery County Historical Society in upstate New York. So, and that's where they lived. So that's how it ended up in New York. Um, that is about all that's known about this robe. We don't know who the weaver was, how or where Colonel Barry got it. Um, and what I'm showing you here is the um, left side picture is the full robe. And you can see that there's, um, if you look at it really closely, there's some spots, uh, especially right here, where the warps are actually, the weavers have actually worn away and the warps are bare. Um, you can also see what Jackie and I think are, is a burn mark of some kind, but it also could be a, a wear mark or a stain or something, but it looks like maybe too close to a, flame or um, the wood stove or something, I'm not sure. And then the <clears throat> right hand um, picture is what um, we weavers have come to, to discover is often the place where the weaver, the person, who, the woman who wove this robe would put her signature. And the signature would be um, different colors or and or patterns, sometimes just color, sometimes just patterns, sometimes both, wrapped around at the bottom of one of the corners, sometimes both of the corners. Now, this looks to be um, green or very light green, but again, this is on the front side of the robe, so it could very easily have um, faded. As you can see, and I'm going to show you in a minute, the, um, 
um, the other side of the robe so you can see. The piece on the right side looks more brown. Um, no, it is black. It is black. There's there's another robe that I that I did see this morning that is brown, but this one was black. And then this is this robe is very fragile, um, and I think. The left side is the front. And I took a picture of this just up close, just so that you could see, you know, how, how much wear and tear it has, it has um, suffered under um, and how much faded um, it has. Now, what's interesting is the right side, the right side picture is the back side. And that is the, so the backside is what the colors originally were. Very vibrant yellow and um, naturally dyed blue, which would have um, been, been dyed with um, the blue. Let's see, I'm not very, I haven't, I haven't really studied the, the blue, but I, I'm, I think the blue was from, um, copper or some kind of mineral that would be um, then put into the dye bath that would make it that blue. So, um, so a lot of fading has happened as well. Um, this is, so the reason why I wanted to do this is that I am hopeful that um, um, other weavers and researchers um, have a chance to come and, and see this because it needs to be researched by not just weavers, but I also think um, we need a form line expert too, like um, Stephen Brown or somebody like that who can come because there's some very interesting space fillers in the design element. element. I'm going to go back to this one more time. And I don't know if, if Robert's still on the on the call on Zoom, but um, maybe he knows something about this too. But there's some des interesting design elements that I don't, I haven't actually seen. And again, I'm still got a beginner's eye. So I'm, you know, I'm not sure about all that, but they look new to me. And so I think having a um, form line expert come in that's familiar with some of the early on form line designs and compositions might be helpful. My guess is that this was designed really early. It was um, the first date that it's known to have come to Bear Colonel Barry's possession is 1886, but I truly think that this was done a lot earlier than that. And it would be nice to know who, who's the weaver. And we may have a, a um, um, be able to track the weaver down from her signature. Okay, so um, I have just a couple more. Um, this is not in this, in this one, but I just wanted to illustrate the pattern board um, accompanied the robe. And this is modern day. This is actually a pattern board that was um, designed and painted by Nathan Jackson from, um, I believe he's living in Saxman now, just outside of Ketchikan, and was, um, and the robe was woven by his wife, Dorica Jackson. And this robe is down at the National Park on display, if you want to see. And they're, they're both there. And then today, um, Raven's tail robes are traditionally made for special occasions, used ceremonially, or brought out and worn um, when it's important and necessary to show status, authority, and respect to visitors. That's what these robes were traditionally used for. They weren't used every day. Today, the dancing robes, especially the old ones, continue to be brought out only for ceremonial purposes and special events. Um, many of the original robes have, have been lost to collectors, sold, um, lost in fires or floods. 
um, and many are still in uh, museums, galleries, and private um, collections. Though the number of raven's tail weavers is increasing and has been increasing since the 70s. And then the number of Chilkat robes, as you can see from this picture, this was just taken um, from a weaver's gathering in, in um, Juneau about 10 years ago um, when we were gathering. And this is Evelyn Vanderhoop. And I'm not, I don't remember the name of the woman from um, that's, whole, that's wearing the other apron, but that was, she was from Portland or is from Portland. And the um, Portland group of weavers were learning, were self-teaching themselves Chilkat weaving and um, had inherited or come in possession of this apron that had been started. And I'm not gonna say who, but it, had, it, it was one of the original Chilkat weavers. And I wanna say who it is, but I'm, I can't, I'm not confident that that's who's, who started it and they took it upon themselves to finish it. And they did, and they brought it out then to this weaving mm -hmm. gathering that we had in Juneau. So, oh, and the other one that I wanted to um, share with you is um, Hands Across the Water, or Weavers Across the Water. And this was one of the last projects that Clarissa Rizal um, orchestrated and helped coordinate before, um, before she died. And it is, um, 47 weavers were asked to do either Raven's Tail or Chilkat. And our only direction was to make it uh, five by five and to have a water theme. And so this robe was finished and um, is now housed down at the um, university in Olympia, Washington. Um, Mine is, this one right here. So waves, crashing waves on the beach is the name of that pattern. All right, that's all I have. So I left time for questions. And I'll put the rest of you all back on so I can see you. So if Zoom folks have any questions, just um, let's see, there, you, there it is. There it is, so I can now can see you. And why grievance is, so Mary Sue Ro Rose asks on why weavings is the weaving done horizontally? So for chill cat weaving, um, the weaving is done horizontally, left to right and right to left, and is often done in sections, not the full robe. Um, so elements of the design will be segregated out and do it. And I know Mary Sue, you can't see um, the robe that I'm working on right now, but there's a chill cat face in the middle and I've just done the chill cat face. And then Next week when I'm done with this, I'll go and do the um, le left top element or the uh, right top element and then go down. For Raven's Tail, the uh, weaving is also done horizontally but in only one direction left to right. And it's done for the, it's done over the full width of the robe. It's not segmented out. So Mary Sue, I hope that answers your question. Any other questions? I'm gonna put my four-way glasses on now so I can actually see you all. <laughs> yes. So how do you, when you come back in on the next section, how do you join the, the two sections? Very good question. So if you, um, once you step, um, stand up, and you're, you're welcome to take a look at that. You'll see that what I've, um, put in is um, drawstrings on both sides of the chill cat face. And so what will happen is when I do the right hand side, um, when I do the right hand side element, I will bring the weaver across and actually um, put the weaver um, 
yarn that I'm using for the weaver into the hole, into the drawstring that I've um, set, already set up. And then at the end, I'll pull everything together and it will like a zipper come together. The other way to do it is to interlock. Um, so the, there's an interlock in between the um, two borders and literally the, for instance, the black, this black side border and the yellow side border are being woven at the same time at the same pace. And when they come together, I'm actually connecting the yellow weaver and the black weaver like this. And then over the top, I'm putting um, several braids over the top of that, which hides that, inter that interlocking connection. You can see it from the back of the robe, but you can't see it from the front. All you see is, is um, braids. Good question, Becca. <laughs> Jackie. Thanks for the wonderful talk and for sharing all these things that you found at the museum. I was curious um, if you're comfortable sharing. If not, that's okay. But I'm just wondering what inspired you 13 years ago to, to come into weaving, to begin weaving this practice? Um, and my second question is, I know that you're, you're doing some really interesting research on um, related to your degree. You're mm -hmm. done with your coursework, but you're working on your dissertation. If you could speak to that a little bit and about some of the ways in which your research has um, gone off on interesting tangents and um, <laughs> you found yourself investigating all these things that you never thought you would get into. I'm wondering if anyone listening or who hears this later yeah. can help you fill in some of those gaps and answer some of those questions. That's why I want you to address that. Fine. Okay. So I have grown up with around basket weaving all of my life. My, um, the, the, my great uncle, William Paul Sr. was married to uh, Francis Lackey Paul, who actually wrote the book on clinket um, spruce root basket making. And so I would, I mean, that was, I was reading that book when I was, as I grew up. Um, but I, but there was nobody ever around to teach me until I moved to Juneau. And then there was basket weavers all over the place. So I just started taking classes and learned how to do basket weaving. And, um, and first, you know, starting with cedar bark first, and then I would go out and gather the cedar bark. And then I, and then I ran into Dolores Churchill and she said, well, you need to learn how to do spruce root. And so I went out and gathered spruce root with her and, and she showed me how to do that, which I dearly love spruce root um, weaving. And then just being in the company, I think of weavers. Um, and then Clarissa was, was, she, it was interesting. She was, for lack of a better word, frantically trying to recruit more Raven's Tail and Chilcat weavers. And she literally pulled together a group of basket weavers and novice Raven's Tail weavers together back 15, well, 2012. So however many years that is and said, you all are gonna learn how to chill cat weave. And I'm going, oh, okay. <laughs> and she put us in this room, in this conference room um, for two weekends, three days each weekend, you know, Friday night, Saturday, Sunday for two weekends and was trying to teach us. Um, and I still run into weavers who took that class because we were literally jammed in back to back and face to face on, in this small conference room and very few of us actually finished it. And you could go up to my loom, right? My table's top loom that I carry with me most places I go. And that headband, that chill cat headband is still sitting there undone. Mm -hmm. And so one of my tasks is to try to finish that at some point, but it's, but it's also a reminder of where I started. And when I finally unpacked that and said, okay, I'm gonna master this, this art, um, I ended up taking almost all of what I had done in 2012 out. And then I stopped myself and there was one element, one square with one circle that I actually kept and did not take out because I wanted to remind myself where I had started, you know, and, and have that evolution. But someday I will finish it. <laughs> And, and it will probably 
be with me. I probably won't do anything with it or sell it or anything. So, um, so that it was, it's all Clarissa's fault <laughs> is, is what, what I tell people um, in a very loving way, because she was, um, she was really adamant about, um, you know, teaching and passing on this art because there was not enough Chilkat weavers. And since her daughter, um, Lily Hope, has been as frantic as Clarissa was and, um, and is just set, held bent on making sure that the, the handful, the short handful of Chilkat weavers that we have that are capable of weaving a full-size adult Chilkat robe is at this point in time, less than 10, less than 15. And, um, and to get, there's 20 of us that are doing these um, small child size robes. And once we're finished, we'll have the ability, we'll have the, the skills and the ability to actually do a full size robe. But we're doing it together. And Lily is coaching us and teaching us every step of the way until we get there and including doing videos that we can look at um, for each element. So there's that. So I, I think that answers your question. It was all Clarissa's fault. <laughs> so, and I, I'm fine with that because it's, um, it's definitely um, keeps me um, occupied as you can see. And I give away a lot of my stuff. Um, so these are the pieces that I still have. Um, and certainly this one is also one that Lily started in 2015 that I just finished um, this last week. And I just finished this one mm -hmm. uh, or last month. And I just finished this one. And I'll just tell you this bottom part here is really an add on. And we, you know, we're, we're on Facebook. Um, weavers talk to each other all the time and, and encourage people. And I, posted this up on face on our Facebook page and Dolly Garza, who is also an excellent um, weaver, um, sent me a private message that said, you know, when I have, cause she observed that I had underneath my chill cat face that I had a whole bunch of fringe that um, she says, well, don't cut that off. Cause I said, all I have to do is trim the fringe and I'm done. She says, well, don't cut that off. Use that to practice. You've got some great warp there. So use it to practice on something that you want to do. And so I did. So I, used, I did one thing and I didn't like it. So I took it out. So then I did something else and I said, okay, well, I'm done practicing now for this. <laughs> and so it was, um, so we're always encouraging and giving each other um, new things. Um, Jackie asked me to share with you rabbit holes and I'll tell you rabbit holes are um, something that I'm going to have to figure out how to put, you know, parameters on my research because um, she's been with me for three weeks now as I go into the back and in my, um, I am studying for, um, starting my research for dissertation. I've been a lawyer for 32 years now and just getting ready to retire and probably the last thing I'm going to do is in, in my legal career is to do research on clinket dispute and justice systems before contact. What, how did we resolve our disputes um, and what made them stick? Um, and what did we do for 10,000 years or 13,000 years, which is now the new figure? And what of those practices can we bring forward to today? I don't think we can go back to before contact because we live in a totally different um, period of time now, but I do believe that some of the practices that we had um, that were based on respect, accountability, uh, reciprocity, uh, making people whole and correcting bad behavior, um, whatever it might be or whatever harm. Um, you know, the Western, <laughs> the Western anthropologists and historians call Clinkett's um, pretty vicious because we, we believed in an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. And so we all always grew up that, you know, Clinkett's were pretty warlike and took slaves. And, and as I'm doing research, I'm thinking, well, that's their version of our history. And so what was really happening? 
I think there was a, a, a sense of an eye for an eye or tooth for a tooth, but it was a little bit more complex than that. I think it was more about accountability and helping to make those who were harmed whole. And so that's what I'm hoping to find and then write about that. And the whole motivation for that research is I have worked in tribal courts for 32 years. And in Alaska, our tribes here, which is more, more tribes in the state of Alaska than anywhere else in the United States combined. And all of our villages and tribes are in the process of developing tribal courts or justice systems. And so I want to be able to share some of the, what I find. Um, and not just what I find about clinkets, but the method of finding what we used to do so that they then, they all then can do the same thing if they choose. So rabbit holes are gonna come and go. Um, <laughs> I think, um, um, you know, there's a sign that I actually asked Rosemary about and we're, we were delving into it. And I think, I think we've finally figured out that it was Emmons who did it, which I mean, Emmons seems to be a pretty, um, pretty secure source that lots of people um, use, but I'm going to try to see, well, what made him think that, but um, <laughs> because I don't consider him to be a, um, a first source or a primary source, um, but there's a, again, in the um, case in the gallery, there's a case of shaman items. And there's a statement in there that's, I think, taken directly from Emmons or, or, or from his information about shamans being mediators and um, called in to help resolve disputes. Well, maybe that was one of our dispute resolution practices um, was shamans which, who have a terrible uh, reputation now. And, but I think that's from Christianity and, and whatnot. So um, what were some of those practices and what made them um, have the authority to do what they did? And um, so I'll be looking for primary sources and there'll be some rabbit holes to go down on that one, <laughs> sure. <laughs> so thanks for the question, Jackie. Any other questions? Everybody's quiet on Zoom. Is it possible June? to get, um, or doing your research to get any information from any of the oral histories that have been handed down? Absolutely. And clinkets are really good because um, between, um, well, not just the Presbyterian churches that has a lot of oral histories, but also um, Sea Alaska Heritage and, um, and the, and there was some, some scholars that were, that predate, and, but were involved in developing the Alaska Heritage um, Institute and, and then what they have. Um, and they have tape recordings and, um, and then also um, uh, oral histories that have been um, transcribed and then translated into English. And even the National Park right down at the end of this road has um, audio tapes that have been translated that um, can be listened to as well. So, yeah, so there'll be a lot of that. I'll have to stay focused. I need to have a game plan. While you're weaving your full size row. That's right, <laughs> that's right. Yes. I, I did read a little today about disputes. Um, maybe along the lines of what you're talking about in some of the text. And um, I was just wondering if you could say anything about what the source was there a primary source of those kinds of disputes when there were violent disputes? Was it about justice? Or was there equally dispute over territory or was territory fairly stable? Or do you have any insight? So I do know that there's a number that disputes are as varied as there are people just like today. And yes, there was disputes about fishing sites, 
um, hunting, hunting territory uh, where you could camp. There was, um, as well as interpersonal, interclan, inter, um, intertribal disputes um, that was happening. There's a story in, and I mentioned this book when I was doing the talk on uh, Tilly Paul Tamri the first week I was here, actually the first day I was here. Um, and there's a, a children's book that um, was written about her life um, called Kataha. And it can, I think it's probably available someplace in any of the bookstores here because it's been reprinted since um, it went out of print. But there's a story in that book about um, my grandpa Tamri. Um, and it was Kataha, who is Tilly Paul Tamri. Um, that's her um, Indian name is Kataha. And, she rem and she's remembering a um, bunch of um, folks coming in from another village, from another tribe, and setting up, setting up their fishing site where they didn't have the right to do that. And, and the way Grandpa Tamri, is, the story goes, dealt with that is not a direct confrontation with them, but he invited them over for a meal. And then he told them a story. And the, and the um, story was about using somebody else's fishing site and how that's not acceptable. And the next morning, and then so it was all just, you know, over a meal and very, to use a Western term, very civilly. And um, the next morning they had packed up and moved along. So they got the message, again, with no confrontation, um, but, but an indirect way. Yeah, yeah, so that's, and that's just one story and I'm sure I will find others. There's a, there's a story about, there was a, um, and it's in Emmons' book, and it's actually in his, if you go to the library and find Emmons' book on the Clinket Indians, and it's like this big, <laughs> It's one of those coffee table sized books and there's a chapter on shamanism in there and he's telling the story about about a theft that had occurred in Klaquan and the, and nobody could figure out what who was responsible for this theft so they called in the local shaman who then put and there was two possibilities of who had committed the theft so they put so the shaman put one party on this side of the room and one party on this side of the room and then put a mouse in the middle of the room and said the mouse is going gonna, is gonna <clears> to <throat> go to who is responsible for the theft. That was, the, that was the, how, how that issue got resolved. And I'm shorthanding the, the, the story. If you want to hear all the more details, because it's quite a lengthy section in that chapter, you know, go to that chapter, go to the library and get that and read that. But, that's essentially what the shaman did <laughs> to resolve that. Yeah. Well, if we don't have any more questions from people on Zoom or we'll doesn't look it. like it. Yeah. Oh, well, thank you so much, Deborah, for your work. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> thanks, everybody on Zoom land. Thank you. I learned a lot from you. Good. Bye.